In 2014, the world witnessed one of the most devastating public health crises in recent memory, the Ebola outbreak that occurred in Western Africa. It was a time of fear and uncertainty and an unprecedented global response for the time. But how did it all unfold? What made this outbreak so deadly and what have we learned since? This is the story of the 2014 Ebola outbreak 10 years later. To understand the magnitude of the 2014 Ebola outbreak, we need to go back to the origins of the virus itself. The Ebola virus, or EBD, was first identified in 1976 in two simultaneous outbreaks. One near the Ebola River, in which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and another in the remote area of the Sudan. Since then, outbreaks have been sporadic, affecting Central Africa primarily. The virus, named after the Ebola River, has five known species. Among these, the Zaire species has been the most deadly responsible for the 2014 outbreak. In 1976, marked the first recognized outbreak of Ebola, occurring simultaneously in two regions. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the virus struck Magala province. The outbreak saw 318 cases with a devastating 280 deaths, an alarming fatality rate of 88%. That same year, South Sudan specifically, the Western Equatoria and Central Equatoria states experienced an outbreak of the Sudan strain of Ebola. Here, 284 cases were reported with 151 fatalities. This resulted in 53% of a fatality rate. Interestingly, in the same year, also saw an isolated case in Wiltshire in England, involving a laboratory-acquired infection of the Sudan strain. Thankfully, this single case did not result in any fatalities. In 1979, South Sudan experienced another outbreak in the Western Equatorial State. 34 people were infected and 22 of them succumbed to the virus, marking 65% fatality rate. After a period of relative quiet, Ebola reappeared in 1994 in the country of Gabon. This outbreak resulted in 51 cases and 31 deaths with a fatality rate of 60%. That same year in Côte d'Ivoire reported a single case in the Thai National Forest. Fortunately, there were no fatalities. 1995 brought another significant outbreak to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but this time in Kwilu province. This outbreak saw 315 cases and 254 deaths, an 81% fatality rate. In 1996, a laboratory-acquired infection occurred in Russia, resulting in one fatality. That same year, Gabon experienced two consecutive outbreaks. The first had 31 cases with 21 deaths, and the second recorded 60 cases with 45 deaths. Additionally, South Africa also reported an incident in 1996, where a medical professional was infected in Gabon and traveled to Johannesburg, leading to two cases and one death. From 2000 to 2001, Uganda faced a major outbreak in its northern and western regions. This outbreak involved the Sudan strain with 425 cases and 224 deaths, a 53% fatality rate. Between 2001 and 2002, an outbreak affected both Gabon and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, resulting in 124 cases and 97 deaths, a 78% fatality rate. 2003 was particularly challenging for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which experienced two outbreaks. The first had 143 cases with 129 deaths, and the second saw 35 cases with 29 deaths. In 2004, the South Sudan reported another outbreak with 17 cases and 7 deaths. 2004 saw another laboratory-acquired infection, this time occurring in Russia, which resulted in one fatality. In 2005, the Democratic Republic of the Congo experienced another outbreak with 12 cases and 10 deaths. 2007 marked a significant outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the Kasai province with 264 cases, 187 people died, a 71% fatality rate. That same year, Uganda reported an outbreak in its western region with 131 cases and 42 deaths. From 2008 to 2009, the Democratic Republic of the Congo faced another outbreak in the Kasai province, recording 32 cases and 15 deaths. 
deaths. By 2011, Uganda's central region reported a single case with one fatality. In 2012, Uganda and their western region experienced another outbreak of the Sudan strain with 24 cases and 17 deaths. That same year, the Democratic Republic of the Congo reported an outbreak of 62 cases and 34 deaths. Between 2012 and 2013, Uganda's central region experienced another outbreak with seven cases, which led to four deaths. These outbreaks, spanning over three decades, set the stage for the unprecedented crisis that would unfold in 2014, highlighting the persistent and deadly nature of the Ebola virus. Ebola is a zoonotic virus, meaning it can jump from animals to humans. The primary reservoirs are believed to be fruit bats, and humans typically become infected through contact with infected animals such as bats or non-human primates, as well as antelopes. But what makes Ebola particularly dangerous is how it spreads between humans. Ebola spreads through direct contact with bodily fluids of an infected person, such as blood, sweat, vomit, feces, saliva, and semen. Healthcare workers and family members are particularly at risk, especially in areas where inadequate infection control measures are present. The 2014 Ebola outbreak was unprecedented in its scale and its impact for the time. But why was this outbreak so much more deadly than the previous ones? Well, several factors contributed to the severity of the outbreak. Firstly, the affected countries were among the poorest in the world with weak healthcare infrastructures. Hospitals were ill-equipped and understaffed and lacked basic supplies such as gloves and disinfectants. The initial cases were misdiagnosed, leading to delayed responses. Secondly, traditional funeral practices in these regions involved washing and touching of the bodies when they are deceased, which significantly increased the risk of transmission. Additionally, the outbreak occurred in densely populated areas, facilitating in a rapid spread of the virus. There were more cases and deaths in this outbreak than all the others combined. It started in Guinea, then quickly spread to the neighboring countries Sierra Leone and Liberia. By July of 2014, it had reached the capital cities of these three countries. The World Health Organization declared the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern by August of 2014. By then, it was already the largest Ebola outbreak in history. In the autumn of 2014, the Ebola virus, which had primarily ravaged parts of Western Africa across continents and ignited global fear. This is the story of how Ebola spread beyond Africa, touching Europe and the United States, and the subsequent international response. The first recorded human-to-human -human transmission of the Ebola virus outside Africa occurred in Madrid, Spain. On September the 30th, 2014, a nurse fell ill after treating an Ebola patient who had been transferred from Western Africa. This patient was a Spanish missionary flown back from Sierra Leone for treatment Treatment. Fortunately, the nurse eventually made a full recovery and none of her contacts became infected. This incident, however, was a stark reminder of the virus potential to spread internationally. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, the United States faced its own Ebola scare on the 19th of September 2014. Thomas Eric Duncan, a Liberian national traveling from Liberia to Dallas, Texas, just days later fell seriously ill. Duncan first visited the emergency room at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital on the 25th of September where he was mistakenly diagnosed with synestitis and sent home with antibiotics. His condition worsened and he returned to the hospital on the 28th of September. This time, testing positive for Ebola. Duncan's diagnosis on the 30th of September sent shockwaves across the United States. Despite intensive treatment, he succumbed to the virus on the 8th of October. Subsequently, two nurses who had treated Duncan contracted Ebola on the 12th and 15th of October. However, both nurses were successful in their treatments and fully recovered. By the 29th of March 2016, the WHO declared an end to the public health emergency. This declaration marked the turning point in the battle against the virus, but the road to this point was fraught with challenges. Liberia was first declared Ebola-free on the 9th of May 2015. However, the country faced several setbacks with new clusters of cases in June and November of 2015. After rigorous efforts, Liberia was declared Ebola-free for the third time on the 14th of January 2016 and has not reported any new cases since. Sierra Leone's journey was similar. Initially declared Ebola-free on the 7th of November of 2015, the country reported two new cases in January 2016, but again declared Ebola-free on the 7th of March 2016. Guinea declared Ebola-free on the 29th of December 2015, reported a few more cases in 
late March of 2016. Over the course of the epidemic, the disease spread to seven additional countries, Italy, Mali, Nigeria, Senegal, Spain, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. The secondary infections occurred in Italy, Mali, Nigeria, and the United States. In June of 2016, the outbreak was declared over. More than 28,600 people had been infected, and 11,000 325 people had died. 10 years on, what has changed? The affected countries have made significant strides in improving their healthcare systems and have had better prepared measures for future outbreaks. International cooperation has also strengthened, which has improved surveillance and rapid response mechanisms. The COVID-19 outbreak highlighted the gaps in our preparedness, despite the early warnings from the Ebola crisis. Inadequate healthcare systems, delayed responses and insufficient global coordination exacerbated the crisis. There were the very same issues we could have addressed post Ebola. Moving forward, it's crucial that we do not repeat the same mistake. The combined experience of Ebola and COVID-19 must drive us to create a more resilient and responsive healthcare system. We need robust surveillance, rapid response capabilities, equitable healthcare access worldwide. As we continue to build to these lessons, we move closer to a world where such outbreaks can be contained swiftly and save more lives. The challenges of the past have equipped us with the knowledge and tools necessary to protect our future. However, are we prepared enough for the next global emergency? Thank you for watching. Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. Like the button for likes, dislike button for dislikes. See you next time.